And part of my calling in the ministry is to expose deception and to save Christians from deceiving themselves. More than the deception that comes from other sources, from cults and fake Christian preachers, which most of us may have light on. The greater danger for those of us who have light on that and are pretty proud that we have light on other deceivers is self-deception. Many a times the Bible speaks about how a man can deceive himself. It's amazing to see how many places in scripture it says about our deceiving ourselves. And uh, it says that God will allow us to deceive ourselves. That's the great danger. And the only way to escape self-deception is favorite passage of mine, one of the most scary verses in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 11. I believe this is one of the most scary verses for any believer if he has years to hear in the New Testament. And that says, God will send on them a deluding influence so that they believe what is false. I can't think of any other verse in the New Testament where it says God himself will deceive people and allow them to believe a lie. I've seen it happen among believers everywhere, all over, in good churches, where they believe something false about themselves. And God is the one who has allowed them to believe something false. And now remember, this is written, verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, to brethren. Brethren. I don't think this is written to unbelievers. Brethren, God will deceive people so that they believe a lie. What sort of lies have I seen? I've seen people who imagine they are born again when they are not born again. I've seen people who imagine that they love the Lord when they don't love the Lord. They are absolutely convinced that they love the Lord. I've seen numerous people imagine they are filled with the Holy Spirit and they are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Imagine living all your life in self-deception thinking I'm something when I'm not, imagining that I have an experience which I don't have, and then finally waking up in the day of judgment and standing before the Lord and discovering in that day when it is too late that all my life I deceived myself. And there wasn't anyone in my church kind enough or wise enough to correct me, to show me where I was wrong, to show me where I was deceiving myself. Because the preachers were too kind to offend me. They didn't want to hurt my feelings, so they let me go to hell, deceiving myself. They let me live a worthless life, even if I did get to heaven, and discover in that day that I did not live as God wanted me to. I take my responsibility whenever I stand in a pulpit very seriously. Many years ago, I said to the Lord, Lord, I don't want any money from anybody. I don't want any, any honor from anyone. I want to make sure that I tell them the truth so that in the day when they meet me at the judgment seat of Christ, they will not say to me, Brother Zach, you never told me the truth. Not one person on earth whom I've spoken to will be able to say that to me. That's my only desire. And that's why I speak as I do, not only here, but everywhere I go. 
because it's an awesome responsibility to stand and speak as the mouthpiece of God to people. The Bible says that, that anyone who speaks, 1 Peter 4, must speak as if God himself is speaking through him. Uh, otherwise, he's got no right to stand up in the name of Jesus Christ and preach to others. He must speak as the utterances of God, as if God himself is speaking through them. So I want to, why, is, why does God allow some people to be deceived? And that's what I want to sh show you here, first of all, before I proceed. Verse 10, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Who are the people whom God allows to believe a lie? Those who do not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. So there are two things there. One, to receive the love of the truth, and second, to be saved. Do you want to be free from God himself deceiving you? I mean, we've got our lusts deceiving us. Ephesians 4 says, our lusts are full of deceit. Jeremiah 17 says, our heart is deceitful above all things. Revelation 12 says, the devil is the deceiver of the whole world. See what we've got arraigned against us. The devil deceiving us, our filthy lusts deceiving us, a heart that's deceitful above all things. Against these three things, our only hope is if God is on our side to protect us from this deception. If God himself joins that and deceives us, we're finished. There's no hope, and I don't want to be like that. I've got lust just like any, any other human being that deceive me all the time. If I'm not careful, I can let my heart deceive me, unless I allow it to be led by the Spirit. And of course, the devil is always around with his demons to deceive me. But my salvation lies in the fact that I have God on my side. And if I, got, if I want God on my side, I have to first of all love the truth. And that means for me two things. One, when I read something in the Word or I hear a message that convicts me about something in my own life, which maybe other people don't know. Maybe your wife doesn't know. Maybe your husband doesn't know. Maybe your parents don't know. But something God shows me wrong in my life. By wrong, I mean not wrong according to the low, good-for-nothing standards of the world, but low according to the life of Jesus Christ. Anything unlike Christ, unlike Christ-likeness in my attitude, thoughts, words, deeds, actions, motives, anything that's contrary to the Spirit of Christ, and the Lord shows it to me in some situation. It could be in a meeting. It could be when I'm reading the Bible alone. It could be when nothing else is happening. It could be when I see another godly man and his life convicts me. And I see something and I'm honest. And I say, Lord, I see something unchristlike there. When I'm honest to acknowledge a lustful look as adultery, nothing less than that, and to say to God, Lord, I'm sorry I committed adultery right now. That's honesty. Or when you're angry with somebody, even though you haven't spoken, Lord, according to your word, I murdered that person in my heart right now. That's honesty. I find very few believers who say that. And that's why they never get free from anger. They never get free from the lust of their eyes, even though they become 70, 80 years old, because they never called sin by the worst name that Jesus called it by. They always gave it some tender, you know, nice name. You never get free from it unless you call it by the worst possible name. Call anger murder. Call lust adultery. Then you'll be free from it pretty quickly. Otherwise, you'll never be free. I predict you'll never be free. I've learned through the years to call sin by the worst possible name you can give it. And that's loving the truth about myself. Anything that God shows me, and not to justify myself. It's such a spirit of self-justification. 
in the race of Adam, ever since the Garden of Eden, when God asked Adam, did you eat of the tree? And he justified himself blaming his wife. The second thing, there's a lot more to say on that, but you can meditate on it. The second thing about loving the truth is this, that when I read the scriptures and I study the scriptures carefully and I find some truth in scripture, which is contrary to what I have believed up until now. Even if I'm a hundred years old, to humble myself and say, Lord, I was wrong for 100 years. And I'm willing to change. I'm willing to publicly acknowledge that my stubbornness and my arrogance and my pride prevented me all these years from acknowledging something I see so clearly in the word. That's loving the truth. And when I love the truth, I will never be deceived. When I was converted, I knew almost nothing of the Bible. I knew the Lord's Prayer and a few things like Christ died for my sins. But there's so many other things in scripture. I mean, if that was all there is in the Bible, you probably need only one page. Why has the Lord put more than a thousand pages here? Scripture. Because there are a lot of other things in God's word, more than Christ died for my sins and I'll go to heaven, my sins can be forgiven. And I didn't know so many things. But as I discovered things, you know, when we are young, just like little children, you teach little children something, you can teach them anything. You can teach them that the moon is made of cheese, they'll believe it. And like that, you know, I was in a church and I had to believe whatever that particular church taught me, their doctrines. And we start like that, but you shouldn't end like that because what that church taught you could be wrong. So as I compared what that assembly I grew up in with God's word, I found a number of things that they didn't talk about. They never taught about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But I found it all over scripture in the New Testament. So I decided I'm going to seek for something my church does not teach me. And I'm glad I did. Otherwise I'd have spent all my life missing out on something God had for me. And I saw things, I had to change my views on many things. They taught me that the church would never go through the tribulation. When I looked in scripture in Matthew 24, Jesus said clearly that I'd go through it. I changed my view. I changed my view on whether Jesus came as a man and was tempted like me in all things. I didn't believe that before. And many, many things that changed my, I, and I had to publicly acknowledge I was wrong. Now I've seen scripture. That's loving the truth. You know, it's very difficult for people who have been believers for many years to acknowledge after that, I was wrong. Dear brothers and sisters, would you rather humble yourself for a moment and acknowledge you were wrong and have the joy of never being deceived for the rest of your life or save your dignity and your false sense of pride there and allow God to deceive you for the rest of your life. It could be a little thing or a small thing. People talk about little commandments. Little commandments given by a great God. Are they little anymore? No. Concerning the Old Testament law, Jesus said not one jot or tittle would pass away. That's like our saying, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Now when you write a letter, even if you don't cross the I, I mean dot the I, people will still understand what you said. But in the law, Jesus said you got to dot every I. And I apply that to the New Testament. That means every little thing. Is a dot over the letter I important? Jesus said it is. And is a little commandment, a very, very little thing in scripture important? For me it is. I'll tell you why. Because I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to spend my life living for the wrong thing. I don't know about you. But I see there's only one life God's given me to live. And I want to live it totally according to the manufacturer's instructions. 
just as I'm careful when I get an expensive electronic gadget to follow the manufacturer's instructions exactly. When it says press this button before you press that one, I do that, even if it doesn't appear right to me. And if I press the other button first and something messes up or the machine blows up, I've got myself to blame. And when I read something in scripture which doesn't appeal to my clever brain, I put my clever brain aside and say, Lord, I'll do what you say. And I'll tell you, after 53 years of doing that, I become a very happy man. I've never had a problem that God hasn't solved because I set aside my clever brain and I said, I'll do it according to your word. I would recommend that way to you. What is the mark of true spirituality? That's really what I wanted to speak on today. What I said so far is just an introduction. Now I want to show you what true spirituality is because we've got so many wrong ideas. We can think humility. That's the mark of true spirituality. If you understand it right, yes. But most people understand humility wrong. They think humility means uh, acting very humble, putting your leg, head down or you know, speaking in a very humble, self-demeaning type of way. That's a lot of rubbish. I never see Jesus speaking in a self-demeaning way, oh, I'm such a wretched sinner. You think that's a very humble man who gets up and says, I'm such a wretched sinner? I don't think so at all. I've heard enough people pray in public, Lord, I'm a wretched sinner. They don't believe it one bit. If somebody else said that about them that behind their back, that that guy was wretched, he'd be pretty upset. That's the proof that he doesn't believe in himself. A lot of hypocrisy in prayer. A lot of pious rubbish. A lot of people think if I'm upright or if I dress in a proper way, that's spirituality. These are all important. But the mark of true spirituality is something far deeper than all this. And if you don't understand it, you can be deceived all your life. For example, humility. Can you tell me one verse in scripture that tells me how Jesus proved his humility and where was his humility seen? Of course, Jesus is the greatest example of humility because he said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29, learn from me for I am humble. He never told us to learn from him how to preach or how to sing. I mean, we spend so much time learning how to preach and how to sing. But Jesus said, learn humility from me. Learn gentleness from me. The only two things Jesus ever said for us to learn were the two things we lack completely, which the race of Adam lacks. Humility and gentleness. We think gentleness is an effeminate thing for women. It's not. A strong man is gentle. Weak men are hard. Jesus was the strongest man that ever lived and he was humble and he was gentle. We've got a wrong understanding of strength. We think strength means shouting, yelling. Jesus never did that. I remember in my preaching as I've sought to understand the Lord's ways, I feel that if I have to shout and yell, it means I can't trust the Holy Spirit to take the words home to people's hearts. Jesus never had to do it. He was forceful in the way he spoke. But he was humble and gentle. And his humility was not seen in his acting like a doormat before men. Being like a doormat, well, let everybody tread over you, that's not humility. No. We need to understand it right. You know, you can take the letter of scripture and... Um, See, Jesus said, when somebody slaps you on one cheek, what should you do? Turn the other cheek. He said that in Matthew 5. Let's see what Jesus himself did. You can't have a better example than Christ. John chapter 18. When the high priest asked Jesus something, when he was standing before the high priest at his trial, John 18, 19. 
Jesus replied to him, when Jesus, the high priest wanted to know about your teaching, and Jesus said, go and ask the people who heard me. Verse 21. And when Jesus said this, verse 22, one of the officers standing by Jesus gave him a blow on his face and said, is that the way you answer a high priest? What did Jesus say? When somebody slaps you on one cheek, what should you do? Turn the other. Did he do it? No, he didn't. That is the danger of following the letter of the law. He said, if I have spoken wrongly, bear witness of me, of the wrong. But if I wrote rightly, why do you strike me? How do you reconcile that with Jesus saying, turn the other cheek? The letter kills. The spirit gives life. Jesus wasn't a doormat for everybody to walk over him. He asked for his rights. If I have spoken what is right, why do you strike me? People have take one scripture and live by that. That's how you go into wrong doctrine. You can take this scripture and live by this and go to wrong doctrine too. I presume they struck him again. He kept quiet. The meaning of what Jesus taught is don't fight with people. You can ask for your rights, but if they don't give it to you, leave it in God's hands. We can ask for our rights in a court of law if you're accused falsely, but if they don't give it to you, well, trust God then. But we don't have a spirit of fighting back with someone who strikes me on one cheek. That's just an example. Where was Jesus' humility seen? I'll show you. As I said, it was not in being like a doormat. What is true spirituality? It's not being like a doormat. It's not in speaking always very nicely. You remember Jesus turned to the Pharisees and said in Matthew 23, said about them, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how will you escape the damnation of hell? That's in Matthew 23, verse, verse 33. What was his humility seen in telling the money changers, will you gentlemen please not do this here? No. He took a whip and chased them out. Learn from me, for I am humble and gentle. That doesn't look very like very gentle, does it? To turn over the tables and make the coins run away. I tell you, if you follow the letter of scripture, you will deceive yourself. Follow Jesus. Look at his example. They spat on him. He never got angry. That's true Christianity. He would never defend himself. When Peter tried to defend him, cutting off somebody's ear with a sword, he said, put your sword back. Don't fight for me. You don't have to defend me. Have you ever said like that to anybody? Are you excited when somebody stands up for you and defends you? You say, you don't have to defend me. <laughs> I can call 72,000 angels right now, but I won't call them. Oh, there's a lot we have to learn about true spirituality. A lot. Because we follow the letter and not Jesus. In the Old Testament, that was okay. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. In the New Testament, you have to interpret the word by the life of Jesus. Otherwise, you'll have a totally wrong understanding of humility. So let me turn you to Philippians 2, which to me is the clearest example of Jesus' humility. The unmistakable proof of Jesus' humility. Philippians 2 and verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, 
He humbled himself by being obedient unto death, even the death on a cross. That and that alone is the clearest, unmistakable, final proof of genuine humility. Total obedience to God in secret, even to the point of death to myself. If you've got that, brother, sister, you got humility. If you don't have that, you can act like a doormat all your life. You're just seeking honor for your humility. You can speak nervously, humbly, put your head down. You're just seeking honor for yourself. Oh, how we like to pray in such a humble way so that everybody recognizes us as humble people. Garbage! Any spiritual man can see through that type of hollow prayer. But because 95% of people in most churches are not spiritual, they admire your prayer. But any spiritual man can see through the hollowness of these pious, bogus, humble prayers. Jesus never prayed those type of artificial, humble prayers. He prayed with great boldness to his Father. His humility was seen in secret obedience to the Father in areas which we know nothing about, which are not even written in Scripture. So many areas, and if you seek the Holy Spirit's light on these things, God, the Lord will show you the areas in your life where you need to follow Jesus in secret, in obedience to God, and then God will back you up publicly. And the proof of humility is that God gives grace to the humble. For me, there's only one proof that I know that God thinks I'm humble, not what people think about me. It's absolutely worthless. The opinions of men, good or bad, are fit for the garbage bin, the trash can. Whether they call me a prophet or the devil, trash can. The opinion of God, number one, most important. The opinion of the devil, even that is more important to me than the opinion of men because the devil knows a lot of things about my private life which you folks don't know. And what he thinks about me is much more important than what you think about me because he knows my private life. It's not more important than God because God knows even my thought life, which the devil doesn't know. So God's opinion is number one. Let's seek to live like that, brothers and sisters. It will liberate you. It will liberate you from the constant temptation to seek honor from men for our holiness or our humility or getting a reputation for something or the other before men. And it will liberate you to truly serve the Lord. Secret obedience before God in little, little things which other people know nothing about. Secret sacrifices that you have made in private which people know nothing about. That and that alone is the proof of your humility. And people may think you're a proud, arrogant man because you whip the money changers out of the temple. Let them think what they like. People can think you're an arrogant person because you speak about serpents and generation of vipers who will go to hell. Let them think what they like. Isn't it enough if God thinks you're humble? And I know if God thinks I'm humble, he will give me grace because he always gives grace to the humble. You don't have to ask him for grace when you're humble. It comes automatically. You know, it's like water. You don't have to force the water to go down to the low place. It just flows automatically. You can't force the water to go up to the high place. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And how do I know I got grace? One and one proof alone. Sin shall not rule over me, Romans 6, 14, when I get grace. I will not lose my temper when I, if I have grace. I shall not have dirty thoughts if I have grace. And if I continually receive grace over a period of time, even my dirty dreams will disappear. That may take a few years because we've lived with so much filth for so long. But if they're not disappearing, dear brother, sister, it's a, I don't want you to feel condemned, but uh, you probably need to take a warning that however humble you think before you are before others, God doesn't think so. Scary dreams which women have and dirty dreams which men have, they're not part of God's will. Let me tell you that. They're not sin because they're unconscious. But it says something about our conscious thought life. It's not one of humility and trust. 
the reason maybe we are seeking so much the honor of men live before God's face he humbled himself by being obedient so what is the mark of true spirituality let me show you Isaiah 14 which is the origin of sin in the universe not in the human race that is in Genesis 3 the origin of sin in the universe is Isaiah 14 where the one whom we know is Lucifer we don't know his name Lucifer is just a King James translation of a Hebrew word in Isaiah 14 12 anyway let's call him Lucifer since he's known like that the head of the angels this is what he said in his heart Isaiah 14 verse 13 and 14 you see the origin of sin do you notice something in Isaiah 14 verse 13 and 14 something repeated two words repeated again and again and again and again there's the origin of sin what is it I will I will I will I will I will five times I will the origin of sin a created being has the audacity and the arrogance to say I will do what I want to do I don't care what God says it's not only unbelievers believers who do that John 6 38 the origin of salvation the opposite of the opposite of this the origin of salvation then you'll understand what true spirituality is here is true spirituality John 6 38 there we read of one who wanted to ascend to heaven in Isaiah 14 and say I will I will I will here is one who descended from heaven Christ Jesus came down to earth he said I've come down from heaven not to do this I will I will I will I will never to do it that brothers and sisters is the origin of salvation the opposite of what Lucifer did not to do my will not to do my will not five times but a million times in his 33 and a half years he never did his own will but the will of him who sent me that is the meaning of the cross if you want to understand what it means to take up the cross here it is to take up the cross every day here it is not my will but thine where my will crosses God's will I have to die to my will there's the cross and if I don't die to my will it's just this horizontal my will that means I do what I like and that's how Jesus brought salvation and it isn't easy we know in the Garden of Gethsemane I don't want to turn to that passage but you know how he struggled to give up his own will you think it was easy for Jesus to give up his own will is it easy for you to give up your own will in some situation Jesus didn't have a sinful flesh like we have we got inherited from Adam because he didn't have a human father but he did have a thing called my will and you see that particularly in Gethsemane his will was contrary to his father's will Gethsemane is the clearest proof of that my will was Jesus said my will is I don't want to drink this cup the father's will was drink the cup complete opposite that is the mystery of the incarnation when Jesus came as a man he did not have sin in him he did not have a sinful flesh but he did have my will and he was tempted in all points as we are and all temptation that came to Jesus in 33 and a half years was say I will like Lucifer say I will choose my will he said no 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 a million times 
And every time he said, yes, yes, yes to the father's will. And if it meant a struggle like Gethsemane, okay, there'll be a struggle, but I'll still do the father's will. That is true spirituality, and that is true humility. He humbled himself by being obedient. I hope we see it. That's why there is no spirituality without the cross. I don't mean the cross on which Jesus died. We need that to begin with, to have our sins forgiven. But the cross in our own life. There is no spirituality without the cross. The one here in this room who's taking up the cross most faithfully a hundred times a day, every opportunity a day, is the most spiritual person in this room, whether he can preach or not, whether she can preach or not, whether other people think he or she is spiritual or not, makes no difference. That is the most spiritual person in this room as far as God is concerned. And that is the person who will have maximum victory over sin because God continuously pours out grace on that person. That's the person who will hear the voice of God most clearly in his or her heart because all deafness caused by sin is gone. The ears are unplugged and he can hear God like John said in the Isle of Patmos, like a trumpet. While people standing next to them saying, I can't seem to hear God speaking to me. Well, you won't. God doesn't speak to the proud. But he's constantly speaking to the humble. And they hear his voice like a trumpet. Especially in moments when they have to take important decisions. You can't suddenly become humble at that time and say, oh God, please speak to me. If you walk that way faithfully for years, in that moment of crucial decision, you will hear God's voice like a trumpet. But if you're unfaithful and you don't confess your unfaithfulness to God and you're careless about obedience to God's commands, you won't hear it. So submission to God in everything, not my will but thine. Hebrews 5, 7 tells us about the struggle he had throughout his life, not just in Gethsemane. Let me read Hebrews 5, 7 and then paraphrase it to you for you. Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, he offered up prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Now I want to paraphrase this without changing its meaning one bit, but explaining it clearly. In all the 33 and a half years, that's the meaning of days, not the last day in Gethsemane. In all the 33 and a half years that he lived on earth with his flesh, which means when he had a thing called my will. That's the meaning of flesh. In the days on earth, all those days when he had this thing called my will, what did he do? He prayed and supplicated means specific, Lord, this particular thing, general prayers and specific prayers, supplications. And how did he pray? With loud crying. That's why he used to go into the wilderness to pray, so he doesn't disturb anybody at home. You know, I sought the Lord about that once, and I said, Lord, <laughs> in most of our towns and cities nowadays, it's very difficult to find a wilderness. How in the world can we go follow Jesus here? And the Lord taught me, you can lie down in your bed and have a loud cry in your heart without any noise coming out of your mouth. I said, that's great. So I can have loud crying and tears without anyone hearing me while I lie in bed at night like without disturbing anyone. I have a loud cry in my heart, Lord, I don't want to do my will. I want to do yours. Is it such a struggle? Yes, it is. Because my will is so strong. And the devil's always energizing it. Do your will, do your will. I have to pray. We think it's easy. Jesus didn't think so. That's why he never sinned. You know why you sin? It's not because you're weak, brother, sister. It's because you're too strong. The day you discover that you sin because you're too strong, not because you're weak, it'll be your salvation. The devil keeps fooling people, saying, oh, you're so weak, that's why you're saying rubbish. It's because you're so strong. 
God is to make you weak. That's the whole purpose of the cross. He was crucified in weakness, it says in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 4 and 5. We also are weak in him and therefore we shall readily die so that we can, a strong person will resist the cross. A weak person submits. Jesus submitted. He stretched out his hands. Hey, please put the nails right there. The strong thieves and robbers say, rubbish, I'm not going to open my hand. Are you like that? There was a difference with the way Jesus was crucified and the thieves and robbers. And the Romans would say to the robbers, stretch out your hands. He said, no, I'm not going to stretch it out. Just, two, three people had to pull his hand. Open your palms. No, I'm not going to open it. But when he came to Jesus, they didn't need anybody to help him. He stretched it out himself. That is voluntarily going to the cross. And there's a lot of application in our personal life. But we need to pray and cry to God to help us. And with those tears, Hebrews 5, 7, he prayed to the one who was able to save him from doing his own will. That's death. The way of death is to do your own will. You see that in Lucifer who said, I will, I will, I will, I will. And then it ended up in spiritual death. And Jesus said, I don't want to go that way. Have you said that? Lord, I don't want to go the way of Lucifer. Your stubborn self-will is the way of Lucifer. Save me from that word, death. And he was heard because of his godly fear. His godly fear of disobeying the Father's will in even one small area. I found very few believers like that who are scared of disobeying God's will in one small area. I sometimes search the scriptures and say, Lord, please show me, is there one little command that I have not obeyed? Is there one little I that I have not dotted? Is there one little T that I have not crossed? Show me. Let us press on to perfection. Yeah, brothers and sisters, verse 11, Hebrews 5, 11. Concerning this Jesus, who many people don't know, we have much to say. But it's very hard to explain because you guys have become so used to sinning that you've become dull of hearing. And the time has come that many of you who've been believers for so many years should have been instructing these things to other people. But you're just glorying in your increased knowledge without spiritual wisdom. And the church suffers. The church is built by crucified people, not by clever people. Not even by gifted people. Gifted people build Babylon. Jerusalem, the true church, is built by crucified people who walk the way of the cross. Matthew 16, we read three times, I mean three things that Jesus began to speak here for the very first time. Three things that Jesus began to speak for the very first time to his disciples. Number one, the church, verse 18. This is the first time that he spoke to them about the church which Satan would not be able to overcome. Number two, from that time, verse 21, he told them how he would suffer and die on the cross. That's the second thing he said for the first time. Number three, for the first time he taught them, verse 24, if you want to follow me, you got to take up the cross too. Those three go together. Building the church, Jesus dying on the cross, we dying with him. They all go together, and that's how the church is built against which the gates of hell will not prevail. And that's a truth which the God of this world has blinded the minds of believers to, that they don't see it. He's not blinded their minds to forgiveness of sins. They know their sins are forgiven. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers to that, but he's blinded the minds of believers I see it like this. Unbelievers have been blinded to the mind, to the truth of Jesus dying on the cross. Believers have been blinded to the truth of their dying on the cross. In simple terms, it's that. Has the God of the world succeeded in blinding your eyes to the truth that you died on the cross? Are you still living? He couldn't blind Paul. Paul could say, it's no longer I. I finished. I died with Jesus on the cross. I'm crucified with Christ. I don't live. I don't live means I don't do my own will now. You go to the graves and you see, does anybody there do his own will? No, it's finished. He was stubborn as long as he was alive. As long as she was alive, she was stubborn, but not now. 
she's dead. She doesn't live. He doesn't live. That's why this truth of submission is something that the Lord emphasized so much. <clears throat> you know, he made a woman to be submissive to man, to demonstrate right from the beginning of creation how the church will be submitted to Christ. And wherever a woman rebels against the authority of man in a home or in a church, or wherever a woman acts like the head of the home, it's the spirit of Lucifer, whether you know it or not. Maybe you were unconscious of it till now, but I've got to tell you the truth. And that's why you find that in the world today, there's the effort by the devil to break down the distinction between man and woman in the way they dress, and now even in marriages. It's all the work of the devil. If you, if you understand, if you know God, you'll see behind all this controversy, which they call a political debate and all this rubbish, it's God and the devil. And a Christian sees it. It says, Genesis 1.27, when God created man in his own image, he created them male and female. And the devil says, no, it's male and male. God created them female and female. Rubbish. He created them male and female. The devil tries to erase that distinction. That's his aim. Because this principle of submission disappears. If it's male and male, it makes the church equal to Christ. You see that? No, the church is to be submissive to Christ as a wife is to the husband. He made Eve to be a helper to Adam, not Adam to be a helper to Eve. He created Adam first. And that's why he says in Deuteronomy and chapter 22, verse 5, a woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on a woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination. Do you know the meaning of abomination? You see, what is God emphasizing there? He's emphasizing the distinction between male and female, which the devil is trying his best to destroy in every way possible. Once you see God's thought in this, I tell you, it will give you a completely different picture of what's happening in the world around. We just read the newspapers, we hear preachers, and say, oh, this is not serious, that's not serious. Once you get into see things from God's viewpoint. The whole thing takes a different picture altogether. The authority of the man, you see for example Jesus and the Lord taught that to the disciples, to the Israelites rather. Take this word for example, Numbers chapter 30. Numbers chapter 30. If a man makes a vow, Numbers 30 and verse 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord, he must keep it. He must do what he said. But if a woman, verse 3, his wife, or a woman who is not married, makes a vow, if the father, verse 4, hears that vow and cancels it, she doesn't have to keep it. Or if she's married and her husband hears it, verse 7, and cancels it, she doesn't have to keep it. But if a man says something, he's got to keep it. See how the Lord is saying that the daughter is under the father and the woman is under the man. You read that passage sometime. Because it's all portraying Christ in the church. We don't see this. That's the reason why the Bible says a woman should veil her head to show that she's submissive to the man. It's a picture of Christ in the church again. We can take all these things out. Well, who bothers about dotting the I and crossing the T? Say what you like. I don't want to be deceived. I love the truth. I don't want to stand before the Lord one day and discover I deceived myself all my life. No. And if I walk the way of Jesus, it will become evident in my whole being, transformed more and more into the life, likeness of Christ. It will be seen in self-control that I have over my speech self-control I have over my way of life, that over a period of time, 
people will see it and say these words. <clears throat> I want to show you a little word, and I'll close with that, Matthew 26. <clears throat> it struck me as I was reading it. Matthew 26, verse 73, you know when Peter was standing in the courtyard when Jesus was being tried, and he kept denying the Lord, saying, I don't know him, I don't know him. One of the bystanders, 73, say, you surely are one of them. For the way you talk gives you away or makes it evident that you are a disciple of Jesus. And I said, Lord, make people say that about me. That the way you talk makes it evident that you are a disciple of Jesus. The way you live makes it evident that you're a disciple of Jesus. It gives you away. The way you conduct yourself makes it evident that you're a disciple of Jesus. And unlike Peter, I'm not ashamed of it. Dear brothers, sisters, can your husband say, the way you talk makes it evident you're a disciple of Jesus? Can your wife say, the way you talk makes it evident that you're a disciple of Jesus. The way you behave, your attitude to money makes it so evident that you're a disciple of Jesus. I said, Lord, may the angels say that about me. It gives you away. The reverse is also true. The way you talk makes it evident that you're following Adam. The way you talk makes it evident that you live according to the flesh, even though you sing wonderful songs in the church. Everything gives us away. Our talk and our walk gives us away. It becomes evident who we are following. The secret of it all, obedience in the secret place, in the areas of our life, when nobody knows anything but God in my thoughts. Three areas particularly in my thoughts, in the attitudes I have towards other people, despising, looking down, or appreciating, esteeming them is more important than myself. It's in my thoughts that I know whether I esteem another person. It's more important. My, it's not like this public relations tactic that Dale Carnegie taught salesmen, you know, speak in a way that how to win friends and influence people. No, I'm not interested in that. In my thoughts, I want to esteem others as more important than myself. Not my words to get reputation for myself or to sell something. And thirdly, in my motives. Three areas of my life that not even the devil knows. The devil knows my private life, which I do things I do in secret, which you don't see, but he doesn't know my thoughts, he doesn't know my attitudes, he doesn't know my motives. Only God sees that. And those are the areas we have to guard the most. If you guard your thoughts like you guard your words in public, if you guard your attitudes to people, like you guard your words and actions in public, if you guard your motives and examine them like you do your actions in public, you are a godly man. But if you're careless in your thoughts and careless in your attitudes and careless in your motives, but very careful about your public life, you are a Christian who lives before the face of men. You do not fear God. You want a reputation for yourself before men, God will allow you to be deceived. I don't want it. I cry out to God with loud crying and tears in my heart, save me from this death. Save me from the death that comes through doing my own will, and living before the face of men. Lord, I want it in secret. I want the angels, if they could look at my thoughts and say, that gives you away, makes it evident that you're thinking like Jesus. If the angels could see my attitudes to people in my private thoughts, they should be able to say, that gives you away, man. It's evident that 
you have the attitude of Jesus. And if they can see the motives with which I do certain things, it should be able to say it gives you, it gives you a way, evident, that you have the same motives that motivated Jesus throughout his earthly life. Dear brothers and sisters, is that possible? It was not at all possible under the Old Covenant. Wonderful New Testament truth. We can walk as Jesus walked. You can have unbelief. Say, not possible. It's exactly what the devil wants you to say. Or you can confess like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let's bow in prayer. Don't believe the devil's lie anymore.